This episode is brought to you by the Procession of the Equinox, the 26,000 year cycle of the sun's hero's journey through the constellations of the zodiac. Do you find you get sick of looking at the same stars on the same day of the year, generation after generation, age after age? Well, the Procession of the Equinox can offer a refreshing change of scenery. Each millennia or two, Procession of the Equinox will send you a new constellation in which to display your sun to your admiring guests on a special yearly feast day. And that's not all. The Procession of the Equinox will conveniently stow away your old stars quietly and safely beyond the horizon. And now, when our listeners sign up with the Procession of the Equinox at their website, they'll send them a brand new pole star, uniquely selected based on whether you live in the northern or southern hemisphere. You've probably been saying, oh man, do we use Thuban as our North Star again? Well, imagine the excitement at your house when Polaris shows up at your door. But the excitement won't end there as new pole stars come every few thousand years. Araya on the year 4000 AD and Alderaman in 7500. And they'll send you free an advent calendar to count down the days of each new delivery with the kids. What fun! When you order, just use the promo code RERED. One word. And thank you, Procession of the Equinox, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Welcome to the Rereading Wolf podcast. I'm Craig Brewer, and normally along with James Wynn, we work our way through one chapter of Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun. However, this is one of our bonus episodes where we talk to authors, artists, and editors who have some kind of connection to Wolfe. This episode, though, is even a little bit different from some of those for reasons that will quickly become apparent. But I wanted to say hi to anyone who's here just to listen to John Crowley and reassure everyone that, yeah, we know we're going down a really deep rabbit hole with this one. But we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, John Crowley, multiple World Fantasy Award winner, Locus Award winner, author of multiple acclaimed and occasionally neglected masterpieces, uh, sometimes they're the same ones. And, and this is going to be the weirdest interview, Craig, that we've done yet, because I don't know if you all have picked up on this from the title, but this is kind of a fan podcast, a very specific writer Gene Wolf, And when we approached John about talking to us, the first thing he told us was that he'd never read anything by Gene Wolf, And we said, that's fine. <laughs> and that's so strange on so many levels, which I'm going to get to in a minute. Anyway, we didn't approach him to talk about Gene Wolf. We approached him to talk about a book written 50 years ago. It, it's not a work of fiction. Um, well, there's some dispute over that, but it's not <laughs> science fiction. It's not fantasy fiction. It, it's a book you might never have heard of called Hamlet's Mill. And it's a book that I've been encouraging Craig to read since we started doing this, because I think it's very significant to Gene Wolfe's entire oeuvre. And then you found a copy on your father's library turns out my dad had had a copy yep it was sitting on his shelf and i have read it now so so yeah and, and then craig posted a picture on facebook and john crowley said hey i love that book and now here we are yes but but you know, so john it's it's strange you've never read anything by gene wolf because like you well for one you're friends with john clute i guess oh yes and wolf. he is often he has often uh, recommended gene wolf to me and told me that i my education would be much limited if I didn't uh, try Gene Wolfe and try to get into it. And I have picked up things occasionally of his and read a page or two, but never very seriously. And I did read, uh, just in advance of this talk, uh, I did read a short story that I'm afraid to say I can't remember the name of it. What was uh, it about? Even now, I don't even remember that. I remember oh. reading it. <laughs> and what I was reading it for more than anything else was for the language of it, mm -hmm. you know, which is what interests me. I'm not very much interested in plots, as you can imagine. It's all pretend, you know. But I was interested in his language, which had a very interesting cast to it. And I think that I have heard other people talking about Gene Wolfe's writing in this way, that it is mannered, but in a very specific kind of way, where it reads as though you are reading something written in the like 1920s at the earliest 
Mm. by a very smart and advanced writer, but who is tied to certain kinds of ways of writing and talking and making paragraphs and making sentences. And that really interested me. And I thought, well, maybe I, I should. And then I went and bought on Kindle the first book of the old son, the... The new son, uh, probably, yes. probably Shadow of the Torturer. Yes. Or, right. or probably or maybe Shadow and Claw. I think that's the way that you have to buy it now. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I have that on Kindle, and uh, I haven't opened it yet, but, uh, you know, I should, mm -hmm. I should uh, uh, make up this gap in my knowledge, uh, even if I don't go very much farther into it. I'll see. Um, that's a good one for language. New Sun is probably where he's he's showing off the most, and it's the uh -huh. most creative, as, at least as far as I would say at the language level, it's just sentence by sentence. It's the most Baroque and the most, um, <laughs> yeah, lots of fun stuff going on. <laughs> well, sometimes I love Baroque language. I, I also tried to read um, A Fish Dinner and Memason. Who was that author? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, he's got a wonderful name, which I can't reproduce now. Yeah, the, the uh, Port Mimazon. Um, oh, yes, yeah, a fish dinner. Uh, and I'm going to look it up right this second. E.R. Edison. Yep. Edison, yep. E.R. Edison, right. That's the guy. Most people and, probably know him from Worm Ouroboros. Uh, yes, the Worm Ouroboros, how yep. you say it. Yes, mm -hmm. right. But I, I preferred the title of Fish, a fish dinner in Memason. I thought that was much better <laughs> as a title. <laughs> and he had his prose, what I could stand of it, uh, probably, you know, 50 yeah. pages or so mm -hmm. uh, before I kind of gave up, was not Victorian. It had this cast of like faux Renaissance, like almost Shakespearean, but mm -hmm. uh, kind of pretend. And it was, it was interestingly done i mean the the idea that somebody would spend that much effort on it to tell this strange fantasy story no i don't know why i say it's it's odd since i've done exactly the same thing myself <laughs> more than once uh so it's not odd it's really not odd and the other one is uh that i've looked into that struck me as i don't know why i mean i have i have no reason to claim that these things go together because i've read enough of them is the one with the huge library in it by um, also by Edison or by someone? No, else? no, no. This is another guy entirely, but has the same kind of uh, intense and different uh, language structures. It's a huge city, and it's got a big library in it with a librarian, and it also went into a couple of volumes. Lots of steps and stairs and stone. I remember them going up and down stone stairs and going into this various parts of this gigantic city castle. Castle that was also a city. Oh, was it Gormancast? Yes, Gormancast. Yeah, okay. gotcha, there you gotcha. go. Gotcha. Yep. I, 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 that one, that one I, I found also, I couldn't finish, but, you know, I did read a bunch of it, and it had the same kind of weird quality mm -hmm. of being unreal in its language. But obviously on purpose, right. uh, which is something that, you know, I think is pretty terrific. You can sustain it. Yeah, that's actually another book that people often compare the Book of the New Sun to. So you might like it. Ah, and you're, okay. you're not alone in not finishing because Pete didn't even finish the third volume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's bad when... Uh, the writer, the re if the reader can't finish it, that's one thing. If the writer <laughs> can't finish it, that's another. <laughs> I guess for starters, we should just go ahead and talk about Hamlet's Mill. Sure. Um, I think it's more proper to say that it was edited by Giorgio de Santiana, a professor yeah. of history and science at MIT, and then written by Ertha von de Schent, a scholar. Yes. Uh, from Germany. Certainly most of it was, but the, but in my opinion, the fun parts were mostly written by De Santiana. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, it's so weird. It's a, such a weird scholarly book, right? It it's like, there, there's no particular order to it. It's, it's just kind of a brain dump and yet it's dreamlike and technical. Right. Yes, it's, it's right. I, there's not there's nothing like it. I uh, I in fact I've got my copy right in front of me now, all busted up and hunks. 
<laughs> as I, I did read it an awful lot. And um, I found it just amazing. I remember a friend of mine who had also read it, and we were talking about it. I said, well, what it is is you can read it and say, well, okay, this <laughs> might not be it. This might not be the full explanation. But whatever the explanation is, it's going to be like this. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this may not be it, but uh, whatever it is, is like this. this the idea of this uh, worldwide civilization that goes from, you know, that has uh, traces in Hawaii and Iran and northern Russia and you know, all over the world, but they're all connected by this somehow, I don't know, you don't know how it could possibly have been connected, but they are claiming that it's connected by this sort of uh, Stone Age priesthood that passes these stories along, all of them coded to represent aspects of the change of the stars and planets. Right, yeah. And it's just, I mean, you just marvel. And the, the stuff comes in from Dashen specifically about, then there's this and this story, and then there's Ham the Hamlet making grinding the mill on the bottom of the sea, and then, you know, this person, mm -hmm. that, this story comes from, Africa and this story comes from Siberia. I don't know. Ah, it's just, it's incredible. And this idea that the world keeps in their vision, periodically just the world keeps falling apart and then it's rebuilt again. Mm -hmm. and, right. uh, and, and which is astonishing. And if there's ever a science fiction idea, that's it, you know? Yeah. So uh, that was just, just wonderful. I had read it. And I had dabbled a little bit in astrology, not as a something to influence my life because I didn't really believe it in that sense, but I was interested in it, how it functioned as a system. But I know, I mean, I had no uh, real uh, personal acquaintance with the physical stuff, but I can remember I, I had just finished reading it and I went up to Vermont. I have family in Vermont and... Uh, my sisters and I were, uh, were out there in their late early 20s, and I'm in my late 20s. And uh, we went out to look at the stars, right? And uh, we brought our little book of constellations out. We were standing in this field in Vermont. And, oh, that's, uh, look at that. There's uh, that, that constellation. Oh, oh that, that one's over there. And uh, as I was, like, looking around trying to find the next thing, there was a mountain or a hill in the distance, and the constellation that was there, I figured it out. It was um, Leo. Leo is, you know, the constellation Leo is also the sign Leo. And mm -hmm. it had begun to, it was risen and was sitting there, and but there was this kind of glow along the edge of this mountain. It was, it was very mysterious. I said, what? I can see Leo. What is that glow? And not didn't take too long before I realized it was the moon rising. The moon was rising in Leo. <laughs> <laughs> a true astrological uh, event. Somebody was born that day, you know, whose moon was in Leo. <laughs> and it, it was just so terrific. And that's the kind of thrill that I got out of a lot of, uh, of, of Hamlet's Mill. We, we were chatting before you had said that people might be surprised at how much that book has influenced you and wow. without giving away, you know, specifics or in, in what way do you see that? I mean, I, I can think of a bunch of ways that I might see some of the ideas popping up, but how do you feel like it has influenced your, your work? Well, I, I can't say that it influenced much of the early work, but certainly when I got into the uh, elaborate writing about astrology and, constellations and turning of the earth and all that kind of stuff in the Egypt quartet uh, that's kind of more where it, where it came up for me because of this ideas that the which the Renaissance was fascinated by they had a much smaller world to you know imagine being periodically rebuilt and so on and so on their own little world they didn't know about you know two-thirds of the world but I did and I could see that they were trying to get at create or imagine the same kind of universe that Hamlet's Mill described. That is to say, one where a universal knowledge is passed along by 
priests and wise men who know not only know do they know the stars and not only do they know these ancient legends they also know about why things exist and whether what the gods are doing when when they make the world <clears throat> and all that and it's i it seemed to me that that even though hamlet's mill was about a period like what two thousand years ago or some enormous number mm-hmm. the renaissance imagination of a world made of the constellations and the stars and forces and the stars and so on they were it was very similar and uh i thought oh wow it's again that thing about well if this isn't it it's something like this is it <laughs> <laughs> and uh so in that in that way it was definitely very fascinating to me and generative of story thinking even though you may not be able to see it in the books as you read them Mm -hmm. i know it's there i know the big thing in the egypt cycle is about you know the there was a different history of the world there were there's more than one history of the world and the thing in hamlet's mill that stands out to me and you you mentioned it before but one of the things that they talk about is how even in the myths there's sort of a deeper myth of what happens when basically the north star changes when when the movement of the earth changes and you move from um shoot i forget the exact stars right but um the the, uh the uh the stars of what we call the big dipper right those are the ones and the one is the north star and it's the one in the middle kind of okay i don't want to lose everybody a lot of people that, of course, they haven't read the book. Well, I'm gonna start, let me get, let me set the table. Imagine that you're in ancient in the ancient world, and mm-hmm. you look up at the at the heavens, and to you, because of everything you see, it's the most natural idea. You live on a disc that's flat, and the yes. heavens revolve over your head, right. and they rise above you and then they continue to, to spin like a sphere above your head. And then they mm-hmm. sink down below the ground, into the underworld, into the ocean or below the sea. And then they rise and every day and every day and every 24 hours from east to west, they rise in the east and they set in the west. And by the same token, every year, those same stars, they slowly over time rise in the east and set in the West. (laughs) But there's also another way that they revolve. And in a way, not exactly true, but in a way they kind of revolve, they kind of revolve the other way, the opposite way from West to East. So that slowly, too slow for you to see in a single lifetime, but slowly they rise in the West and set in the East. So that if you were to look at the same location in the sky Mm -hmm. uh, for the same night on the same day of the year over 150 years you would see those stars slowly rise from the west and move Mm -hmm. toward the east and stars that you would normally expect to see in the east at sunrise you wouldn't see them anymore they would have sunk (laughs) below the horizon (laughs) right right and yes the and about uh 200 BC, a a Greek astronomer described this. He Mm -hmm. discovered it. And the argument of Hamlet's Mill is that he didn't discover it. He rediscovered it. Right, exactly. Our ancestors recognized what was happening as any culture that marked the location of stars, like you had a Stonehenge or something. So they marked the location of the stars. Any culture that did that for you know, three or four generations would have noticed that. Yes. And he says they know it, but they, but unlike us, who de- we describe this kind of thing by mathematics, they right. didn't do that. They described right. it with stories, with myth. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, right. Uh, that's all very well done, very well put. I couldn't have done it uh, that neatly. But you're, the, the thing you were talking about, about the movement of the of stars toward the West, a rising more and more closely to the west as time goes by over the centuries is the precession of the equinoxes right right that's when the equinox the night then it's the same length as the day uh that per- precedes towards the west and in the night of the equinox the stars of the equinox end up in a different constellation right right and the precession of the equinoxes brings the stars into different constellations. Have I got that right? Maybe not. Oh, well, it 
brings the sun into different constellations uh, relative to where it used to be against the background of the stars. But anyway, the precession to the equinox does do that. And this is this was uh, part of the interest that it had for me was that in the 60s, when I was reading this kind of stuff for the first time, was the time when dawning of the age of Aquarius, because the stars were moving, the sun on the equinox was moving out of Pisces and into Aquarius. And so it was going to be a whole new world right. where uh, everything was going to be better because Aquarius is a much nicer sign than Pisces. <laughs> uh, I knew because I had a girlfriend who was a Pisces. And... <laughs> anyway, it, it, it was going to be a great age because Aquarius is a, is, a, is a nicer, kinder, gentler kind of constellation. And I thought this was just so amazing. Here we are, the ancient, ancient d- discoveries of these old people we were just describing were still being talked of mm-hmm. in 1967 as though everybody knew what it was. Oh, yeah, it's going out of Pisces into Aquarius. It's going to be a wonderful age. <laughs> right. And you, you just marvel. And I did. I mean, until I read the book, and when I did read the book, I said, oh, my God, that's what they're thinking of. Even though it's just almost impossible to figure out how they came to know it. What was the chain of connections for all these storytelling, star storytelling, and mapping, and all that, and the religious import of it all? And it ends up being, what, a thousand years, two thousand years mm-hmm. later? And they're still, mm-hmm. it still has power over people's feelings. It just amazed me. Yeah. That's also probably one of the big criticisms of the book is that it, it doesn't lay out that chain of how you <laughs> get to that understanding. Instead, oh. what it does is it finds analogies in all these different myths. But that, to me, yes. is actually the big power of it is that what it what they're really trying to do is come up with a kind of Ur language or Ur, Ur story that's yeah. underneath all other myths from all other cultures. And it's right. that story of the Zodiac and of the changing of the stars that that really, for them, is the fundamental vocabulary that's underneath any culture's mythology. That's sort of the bigger, one right. of the bigger that's claims. Certainly, that is certainly the, the, uh, the biggest uh, uh, concern of, of certainly Dush and uh, I think Santillana, who was, a, who was, of course, written the biography of Galileo and all, um, has a, much, a more modern person's kind of view of it, even though he's certainly... Uh, is guiding us through this crazy world of, you know, lost dead animals and living animals and monsters and mills under the sea and all this kind of stuff. He's guiding us through that. But he, I'm sure, you know, he wrote about Galileo. He knew what the, certainly the Renaissance view of uh, the heavens was and what why Galileo was so uh, uh, scary to people at the time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think in a, in a way, there's a couple of books like this, like Hamlet's Mill, books that take up some topic that you sort of think you know a little bit about, or could listen to a lecture about and say, yeah, okay, I get it. But there is a they're much more revolutionary. I mean, I don't know if Hamlet's Mill ever really attained the stature of something revolutionary in thought. I'm not sure. It certainly changed me. I mean, I, I, I was swept up in the revolution that it seemed to be expressing. Oh, I've never been but able are... to look at the night sky the same again, or oh, yeah. or hear a you know read a myth from 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 a Greek myth or um, when you look at the old versions of Jack and the Beanstalk. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they 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 incorporate so much in that. that um, <laughs> yeah. The the Flying Dutchman, the oh. uh, Puss in Boots. They go on and Puss on about boots. Puss in Boots. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the foxtails, the burning foxtails. Mm-hmm. In the story of Samson in the Bible. That was a great one, too. I, that one, uh, uh, the foxes there let go into the corn with their burning tails. And that burns down the corn. Mm-hmm. But uh, that one, uh, that one, I could never figure out what they're trying <laughs> What in the heavens? What in heaven's name <laughs> are they talking about? Here? Yeah, they, I got lost so many times. I was, but yeah. the beauty of it is that, oh, okay. 
I don't understand what they're talking about, but I get it. Oh. Yes, yeah, yeah. Right. You're, uh, it's it, I, they may be wrong here or there or there. There, it sounds it sounds really involved. Just the way I probably sound to other people, but but yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, that's what <laughs> I thought about it. I, what I thought about it was they may be wrong, but if they are wrong, what is the real truth? It's got to be something like this. It's got to right. have this kind of components, or you know. Uh, they've obviously left something out unless it's as rich as this, which is mm -hmm. really kind of wonderful. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's the good. Here's, let me give you a, a, give a really good example of, I don't even think they bring this up specifically, but once they had laid it out, all these connections, I started doing on my own. So we have the story of Kronos. Kronos mm -hmm. is the son of Gaia of the earth. Yep. And the um and and Uranus the sky was oppressing her, so right. he castrated Uranus. All right, so here's here's the way to understand that story as Hamlet's Mill would tell it. If you look up in the sky, you see uh, the constellation Orion. He's got a right. he's got his arm up there. He's got more like a sickle, like Cronus. Yeah. In fact, when we say right. Father Time and all, he's yeah. with a big sigh. Originally, he's Kronos yeah. with a sickle. Yeah. And so he's, right. he's up there. And now right above at his hand are two convergent things. One is the Milky Way, which can mm -hmm. goes right through his, through his arm there. Yeah. And the other is the ecliptic, the, the path of the sun across the sky. The, that, the ecliptic is the cycle shape, sickle shaped thing. Right. Yeah. And so you imagine that Orion is Kronos. You've got this big Milky Way thing coming down from the sky into the earth. That's the sky's penis. He's oppressing Gaia. He castrates it. What happens then? <laughs> now the sky is unanchored and can now shift. And that is basically the story of Hamlet's Bill. And then what happens? Kronos is... Um, I guess what I don't know to call is I guess it's his grandson, uh, Hermes. He also carries a curved sword. And then we have the story of when Hera kidnapped Io, and then she sets his her guard over to watch him. So what right. he Argos, the monster with a thousand Argos, eyes, or as Ar right. or as Ovid calls him, starry-eyed Argos. Uh, Argos is the uh, Scot. <laughs> Hermes comes up with his curved sword cuts his throat and his now his his head shifts the sky shifts the stars shift it's the procession of the equinox once again right hermes right. gives his curved sword to perseus who has to <laughs> uh, who goes off he does the same thing it's the same right. story over and over and over and over that's yeah. i don't even think that they said that but once they they kind of laid it out, and I, I got my my mind around it. I said, oh, it's everywhere. It comes up and up and up. Right. That's it. That's great. A great pre As soon as I started hearing you do, I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I remember it all. I mean, I haven't read the book in a very long time. But, uh, yes, I remember that kind, that kind of stuff. And all the time you're reading, you're saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> At the mm -hmm. same time as you're saying, wow. Wow. <laughs> It's just, it, it's, it is remarkable. There really isn't anything like it. Though it does so, seem to me that uh, there are uh, kinds of books that are like it because of having that same kind of effect of you thinking you're a kind of historically minded guy and you've read a lot of stuff and you've accumulated a lot of ancient visions of this and that. And then one of these things comes along and changes it all. Mm -hmm. And in addition to this, I was, I was thinking about Stuart Clark wrote this book called Thinking with Demons. Do you know that one? I don't know that one. No, uh -uh. It's a It's a great, great book about what were called or considered at the time demons in a different sense than, than we use it. How the idea of a demonic world in which we're kind of caught in or at least doing battle with or whatever is, can work, how it works. That how do, how do demons, what do they do? What, uh, what do they... Uh, what powers could they possibly have? Does God allow them to have power of those kinds of powers, or uh, do they have them uh, by just by dint of being demons, or do they 
can they, how can they do they uh, they have goals to to achieve and uh, what uh, Clark was, was trying to show was that when people in that period who thought about demons all the time this is the middle of the witch graves and the you know, burning of witches and all that and what he was trying to say was that in order for for instance witch trials to go forward you had to create uh, this thinking model in order to get through it for instance if god is good and uh saints are good and the, the mass is uh is perfect and pure what are the witches They're the opposite of everything that, that is witches are dirty and filthy which which is spoil and ruin crops they don't grow and like the sun shines on them and which uh sabbath which is sabbaths instead of white pure circles of flower that are the uh hosts at mass they have a piece of horrid blackened turnip and instead of giving the kiss of peace to the celebrants in the mass they kiss the devil's ass everything is different <laughs> everything has an opposite and this is the way he says thinking in this period went on in this fashion by sets of oppositions and that's how you think with demons <laughs> you, you by by assembling these these oppositions, you can prove that one thing is good by comparing it to to something that is bad that has this, has the same ontological set of stuff in it. It's just the wrong set. And I thought that was also just wonderful. I never, I mean, you think about you hear about the witches' sabbaths and you think oh, it's just a bunch of crazy people persecuting poor old women and stuff. It's much more complicated than that. It really is based on a set of uh philosophical arguments that you can make by doing this kind of one uh one side the other side this matches mm -hmm. that kind of thing that was just great yeah i feel like i know you like francis yates because she's she oh yeah comes up of course in the books but in some ways her books kind of did that for me of getting into the mindset of the renaissance especially oh, yeah. sort of understanding how alchemy wasn't just you know crazy greed weird science but actually had its own <laughs> interior logic to it right yeah. exactly that's very true i thought she was knocked me out <laughs> and also to, to understand alchemy is not <clears throat> mostly you know doing stuff with furnaces and you know all that but a mode of thinking about the world what the world's made of that was this that was really great yeah the another book that i that i i was thinking of as i was Think about Hamlet's Mill. Do you know Black Athena? Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, that, yep. that works the same. That to me worked the same way. Yeah. It's like yeah. you don't know the real thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the evidence to set up the real thing, which is much more interesting than the one you've been living with all those years, mm -hmm. can now be assembled and shown to you. You know, and you can, you can have, a new, have a new world to live in. Uh, the idea that, uh, the Greeks got their gods from Egypt and not the other way around. And uh, it was just an enormous a revelation to me. I, I said, but that's so, it makes such sense. It's like, all right, maybe it's not so, but it sure makes a lot of sense. And if, and if I'm gonna believe something else, it's gotta have as much sense. And the, and the standard issue accounts just didn't have it. And, mm -hmm. and these books did. Well, it seems like that's what the Egypt cycle is in many ways about, is somebody trying to write one of those books. Um, <laughs> I mean, or I don't know if Fellows Craft had written one. Um, well, we don't know. I, that's, that's, right. the, that's one of the great mysteries in the, in, in, the, in the book, is who's writing that book? Right. Or how does it come to be, and did it ever get finished? <laughs> if so, who finished it? I always have left all that kind of, I'm afraid, up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> And, I mean, in a sense, that's what you get at the end of Hamlet's Mill. You don't actually, at the end of Hamlet's Mill, say, that's it. Now I'm Yeah. It. You don't. You don't <laughs> yes. think that. You say, wow. <laughs> wow. That's about all you can. The summing up is close to the beginning when he when he's talks talking about um, uh, a guide to the, I forget the name of the chapter, but it's, it, it's where they try to catch you up to speed. And uh -huh. that's really uh -huh. kind of what, the ending in a normal scholarly book would be you would where you <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them then you tell them and then you tell them what you just told them uh -huh. have you read uh umberto 
Echo's book. Foucault's Pendulum. Yes. Yeah. I read it I when I was not. very young and so much of those things went over my head, but actually I, I found a paperback copy and I've been wanting to reread it lately, but it seems yeah. like it's kind of trying to make the same or a similar kind of argument of looking back through all these ancient texts to try and figure out a kind of lost story that you right. can put together. Which, by the way, I, we could say for the people listening who are wondering what the heck any of this has to do with Wolf, so many of Wolf's stories take pieces of myth and make them unfamiliar on the surface, but then there are ways that you can try to figure out, okay, well, how does that myth structure the story, but then the story is doing something a little bit different with it or going in a different direction. Or people will know in the in Book of the New Sun that you got, there's actually a book in there called The Wonders of Earth and Sky, which really is retellings, half retellings of lost myths and stories and history. And right. Wolf mm -hmm. gives entire chapters in there and we read them and you're like, okay, half of this I understand and half of it seems like surreal nonsense. But when you look at it, you can find how different parts of different myths or histories or stories have just been rearranged and woven together in different ways. And what's kind of fun about that and why Hamlet's Mill, I think, is so interesting is that Hamlet's Mill suggests that there is a way to get back to this sort of full story of the night sky if you start mm. to piece all the different myths together. Um, that's kind of mm -hmm. that, that hidden story behind everything else. And, and so much <laughs> of Wolf kind of is always suggesting that there is a story like that underneath things. If you can right. just, uh -huh. if you can be patient <laughs> enough to find it. But, and so okay. a lot of the books that seem to belong in that Brown book, like, uh, the boy who hooked the sun or the woman whose rolling pen was a sun, you really can't connect them to a particular myth, but if you kind of run them through the Hamlet's Mill Transformer, it's suddenly, <laughs> oh, I can see, oh, okay, Wolf is, is making a Hamlet, what, what Hamlet's Mill called a true myth here. True myth, um, yeah. <laughs> so they, you know, as opposed to crude folklore that's just, you know, people telling stories around the campfire, true myth is about time, it's about the cosmos. And, uh, yeah, right. I, there's a line in there, and I just... I just know it inspired Wolf. It, it says, um, science fiction, when it is good, is a wholly valid attempt at restoring a mythical element. At, with its adventures and tragedies, its meditations on man's errors and man's fate. And so, yeah, I really, from, uh, well, every novel from The Fifth Head of Cerberus to at least an evil guest, which I think was published in 2004. Yeah, I can see, oh, he's doing this exact same thing. And a bunch of the, of the short stories as well. Uh, we just, for Christmas, we read Wolf's uh, short story, uh, War Beneath a Tree. And mm -hmm. all right, look, if you didn't listen to it, people, turn it off. I'm about to explain it. So the <laughs> idea is that the toys at Christmas, they're all, but remember that in Hamlet's Mill, the tree is the sky, right? Right. Yes. And right. So Heaven tree, as Joyce said. Right. So <clears throat> everyone, it, this is a time when everyone has these robotic toys. And uh -huh. on Christmas Eve, the old toys have to battle with the new toys coming <laughs> in. And they're, of course, they're, they're designed to be, you know, replaced. So the old toys always lose. And what they do, what the new toys do when they finally win the battle is they, and some of, some of the new toys get damaged in the battle, but they, uh, when they, when they beat the old toys, they take the old toys and they throw them in the fire. And <laughs> then, then you have the new toys. And this is a, this is, that's, this is Ragnarok. This is, um, oh, right. sure. the, the Tuatha de Danan and the Fomorians. This, <laughs> it, this, it, it's a whole, it's, it's such a, a, a vignette of what they're, kind of drumming over and over and over in Hamlet's mill. So. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's great. One thing about Jean and I uh, is uh, partly, and if we are thinking in the same kinds of ways in which, I mean, I've always been told uh, we are, I don't I haven't read enough to know, but we had that we grew up in the same, with the same training in believing in stuff. We both grew up Catholics. 
I, I believe that he that he was. Oh yeah, yeah. yep, he's, he did. He yeah. converted when he got married around that time. He yeah. converted when he got married. Oh, so he wasn't it wasn't a childhood in training. Uh, no, like not mine. childhood. No, not quite. I grew up as a Catholic, and one of the things you have to do as a Catholic child growing up is even more than maybe Protestants, although maybe not as much as Buddhists. Or, I don't know. Uh, you have to believe in whole lots of stuff. That's one of the things you learn to be able to do. Uh, and of course, when you're a kid, it's it's fairly easy to believe in stuff that seems impossible. Like Alice in Wonderland. I, who is it in Alice in Wonderland? Says, oh, it's the Queen, the the Red Queen, who who uh, I I can believe in three impossible things before breakfast. Yeah. And that was kind of what growing up Catholic was was kind of like. And it had the same kind of end result that I was talking about, about how if, if this isn't it, something like this is it. You mm-hmm. always think that even though you've discarded all the stories and all the miracles and all right up to Jesus, you know, that you can free yourself or you feel like you can from all of it. And yet, if it, that's not it, what is it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what is, what, why is it such a huge tale? And so... Yeah. Um, long and so powerful, and of course, anybody. I mean, if Dutch and had and Santiana had chosen that Christian mythology in that Catholic form, full of all those miracles and carrying on that the Protestants all discarded, they could have come up with a, a different story because it's all those myths and all those miracles all have the same basis or their own, or at least their foot in, those ancient stories, too, that mm-hmm. Hamlet Smell is using. Wasn't yeah. Jesus born at the beginning of the age of Pisces? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, he was. At the, at, the turn, at the change of the star, at the change of the uh, equinox, from it, when it slipped from Capricorn to Pisces, is that right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I, think I think Jesus right. was born in the, in the, under the sign of Capricorn. So yeah, no, he's definitely a a, 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 a spy. <laughs> More than anybody, he's somebody who comes to signal the idea that all right, we got a new universe, uh, new suns, new new stars. Even though the perceived universe, the perceived solar system, uh, doesn't really change, but the meaning of it does. And I think that's what a lot, all these myths and stuff are, are saying. You you can perceive a changed universe even though nothing has changed. <laughs> the stories are stories, but they still signify some huge change in human existence. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a the Nativity Ode. Milton's Nativity Ode um, talks about the change from the pagan world to, right. uh, to the Christian so world. Oh, yeah. But I've been ever since I read Hamlet's Mill, I told James, I've wanted to go back and reread that with just an eye to all the stars and other stories and see if something like this is going on in that in that poem. (laughs) It's got to be. It's got to (laughs) be. Right. And Milton obviously was felt very bad about it. (laughs) They all had to go get this sent away and banished and all that kind of stuff. (laughs) Being himself half Greek, half Roman. And uh, yet a believer, yeah, right. Well, that's one of the nice things about being a Catholic was that you did have a gigantic apparatus, a mythology that was actually, even if as even as children, we could make fun of some of it. You know, it was just so silly. Some of the crazy, like Saint Nicholas. You know, Saint Nicholas. That's Santa Claus, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. St. Nicholas's first act, uh, and the reason he got connected, <clears throat> apparently, to children was some, I can't remember what, evil king or somebody like that, boy, children in a, and uh, St. Nicholas got, brought them out, brought them back to life again, pulled them out and brought them back to life again. Uh, and that's why he's connected to to children. And you could, I mean, you hear the story about all the <laughs> the, the boiled children. It was hilarious. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> and we're glad he did it, and we're glad that he got the idea of taking care of children. It was it was pretty terrific. And the, of course, the three kings that come at Christmas, 
are followers of a star and they're all they're mm -hmm. astrologers they're you know right they, yeah, they, yeah. yeah that's what yeah. they do and uh they have they have followed the star which we all thought was very peculiar especially in this in the song we three kings of orient are yeah that's not what they're doing they're not following a moving star right they are they have already studied all the all the uh astrology of it the astronomy of it and they know where they're going mm -hmm. uh but you don't figure that out until you're you're grown up but it still retains you know and i'm sure then hamlet's mill i remember many trios of things three yes is an right. enormously powerful number and those are three kings and uh they've come to call jesus a king that's what they're there for in the mythology so yeah it was it was it had great charm and i can remember actually the very day i was probably six, 16 or 17 um and i had just gone through a whole easter ceremony at my local church and uh was walking home from church and i just suddenly realized uh i can't do this anymore mm. i don't i don't i'm not part of it it's not part of me that's they may be right they may have it all right it doesn't matter i can't do it mm. i just can't do it anymore which was not I mean, it was a mental event to realize that I had chosen to do this. It just, I said, I suddenly understood that I was not in it any longer and have not been since, even though there is a huge residue you can never get rid of. And a lot of love and beauty and all that kind of stuff. There's no doubt about that, too. I wonder if there's something particular about Catholic imagination. I mean, we, we talked about how you come up when people want someone other than Wolf to read, and Lafferty was Catholic. Everybody right, yes. that I know is a huge fan of Chesterton. I mean, you got yeah. Tolkien in there too, but all of, I wonder <laughs> if there's some way to figure out what the, is there some kind of distinct <laughs> Catholic imagination in sci-fi fantasy speculative lit stuff? Right, I don't well, know. that's I don't know. Tom Dish too. Michael Swanwick, we talked to him a while back, and he talked about the yeah. similarities with, yes. Jeff, with Wolf. Right. Yeah. It is a training in believing in stuff. That's yeah. basically basically what it is. And then the power that it grants you when you can reject that without rejecting your training. It's like going from being an athlete to being um, a soldier. Same stuff. I've done it all in the gym and I still got it. Just applying it in a different way. Yeah, someone needs to write the Hamlet's Mill for the connective tissue of Catholic fiction so. <laughs> I had an awful moment today just today <laughs> thinking I once proposed a few years ago I proposed an article on other Catholic churches I don't know how many are left now this is like you know, 10 or 15 years ago and they were probably weak then and probably who knows now but there are dozens of Catholic congregations that believe themselves to be genuinely Catholic Roman Catholic a lot of them had, some of them had their own popes. Uh, some of them had, you know, nuns who could get married, or priests that could get married. Uh, some of them had female celebrants at mass, the whole thing. And there were lots of them. Some of them were incredibly rigid and uh, they were believed in sede vacantism. Don't know if you know about that. Is that uh, little... where the, 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 the pope's seat is vacant? Is that... Right, the pope's seat is vacant because the current pope there is not really the pope. Yeah, yeah. I dated yeah. a girl who's, uh, who was a believer in that. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just, I was reading over this. I happened to I'm trying to clean out old files, and I came upon this proposition, proposal about old Catholics, and I read it again. I said, oh, but wouldn't it be great to just write a story within that universe, maybe go from one kind of crazy Catholic thing to another, and... Uh, I could just suddenly see a, a novice, you know, in his cassock, you know, getting kneeling down at the all. I said, no, 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 stop. <laughs> You're not going to do that. You're not going to write that book. That's <laughs> Time is gone. But it, it made me think, oh, my God, it really still is in there and still a source of possibility. So it's crazy. OK, well, let me take a shot. I'm, cause you're about to read the book of the new son. And I right. should say, I'm going to go ahead and spill the beans for people who've been reading this book for a long time. 
a new sun, a new sun is a term for what we've been talking about when, because of the yes. procession of the equinox, the sun rises in a different constellation. Right. Right. And so the, in fact, if you, if you ever read the uh, Papal Va, uh, where there's the, the myth of right. Quetzalcoatl, right? right? And there's the black sun and the, the, it's just a succession of suns. And so mm -hmm. it's right there in, in the title. Now, I don't know. Here's a, here's a question that always creates. So are you saying that every scene in this long, crazy novel is actually just mapped out on the sky? And my answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, probably not. <laughs> but... It keeps popping up. It keeps popping up over and over and over. Right. There's over and over in the in the novel. You're going to hear these clang. You're going to see clanging. You're going to see bells, and mm -hmm. I'm sure every one of those events occurs in a section of the sky that's close to the center of the galaxy, called the the Great Rift. Right. It's like a big Great empty Rift. space, yeah. and there is a there, there's a little tiny constellation called the Dumbbell uh, Nebula. And it comes into play, and I, I I can't go into how all the ways, but so let me give you an example. Here's the here's the first chapter, so it's not a spoiler even for you. Severian shows up at a gate. Of course, you know how important gates are oh, in yes. Hamlet's Mill, and also in astronomy. In, in Egyptian astronomy, there's the summer gate, the other gate. Hey. The, the the shadow of the torture starts at the gate, ends at the gate. And a night watchman shows up with a with a big key around his neck, and um, I, I think that's I, I can't the, the name the name of the constellation uh, uh, just escaped me. But he the star in that constellation is called the White Night Watchman. So uh. he shows up. Severian is there while he's talking to them. A big purple laser beam shoots across the sky. Okay, so this is like the uh the the milky way right and it's a it's a mm -hmm. big loud crack big loud event because this is a change in the uh -huh. as hamlet's mill would, would define it as a uh -huh. change in the and severian takes off down this this white bone path and and he he's running running when the laser beam shot off he could hear monuments crashing to the ground, yeah, you know, because the stars <laughs> are crashing below the, the horizon, and then he comes to the scene of, of this grave, and there are three people gathered around it, and um, yeah, I, I, I can pre pretty much identify every see, part of this scene as I can just follow it along the sky, <laughs> and as I think that all of these stories, the Fifth of Cerberus, Peace, Book of the New Sun. Soldier of the Mist, Castle View. It's a little bit vaguer in that, I, I admit, but but definitely there are doors. And then when he gets into the Book of the Long Sun and the Book of the Short Sun, he just goes full full bore on it. But <laughs> all of these are about the the Mayan calendar of 2012, which is the, supposedly supposedly the end of the world, right, and yes. it's the time when the sun moves across the center of the galaxy, which is really weird because according to the experts, it's not possible for the Mayans to have been able to detect the center of the galaxy <laughs> at that location, <laughs> but moves across the center of the galaxy. And that's why it's supposedly the end of the world because it's the end right. of the old world, as with in the book of the sun, when the when the old world ends, the new world begins. So... Right. Yeah, this this story just goes on and on and on and on. And <laughs> there's a there's a story. I first detected this when I read. There's a little brown book story in the second novel called "The Tale of the Student and His Son." And yes, it's got the story of Theseus imprinted. Mm -hmm. It's a you know it's a retelling of that. Also of the uh, the battle of Confederate battle with the the, the Monitor. It's got a lot of stuff, but it's also you can map the night sky across it as it goes huh. step by step. So, the, the, step. are the three people in the graveyard are they women? No, no, they're not. They're two men oh, okay. and a woman. 
But w- at oh, one okay. point, one character who is Scorpio hands him a coin, and and there's a, I mean there's 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 actually a star there, but of course the coin is also the sun moving right across oh, at right. that location. Yeah. And right. there's a, yeah. in the next chapter, Severian goes and he looks at that coin and he stands in the wall where it's broken. And uh-huh. as he stands there, he lifts up that coin above his head. And so he can the see, gap. And a light shines right on that coin. <clears throat> and mm-hmm. light is, oh, well, this is, <laughs> okay, I see this. This is obviously a vignette of, of Orion and the sun. Yeah. And so <laughs> I don't know that, that Wolf is mapping the entire thing, but he is, he is recreating myth. In the book of the right. new sun, I get it. Okay, all right, you convinced me. Yay! <laughs> I bought the book anyway. You know, I have to read it now. Uh, well, well thank, thank you very you. much. That was really enjoyable. I I, I had a lot of fun. And, Great. Uh, I'll thank be looking so forward much. to your to your cleaned up version, Absolutely. so I can announce every to everybody to go listen to it. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Appreciate Good. It. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> But we wanted to add a little bit more to our discussion because obviously if you're coming in here just to listen for Crowley, you just got a discussion of all kinds of things maybe you weren't expecting. But that is part of the fun that we had with being able to ask people to talk about topics that are really specific and maybe not just having them go over their latest book. So we wanted to add a little bit more about why this topic in particular was so interesting to us. And the main reason is because James has actually been working on something for a long, long time about Wolf and about a lot of the ideas from Hamlet's Mill. And um, I say working on as in writing. So it's you are you have a project that has actually taken form. It's totally out of control. (laughs) <laughs> but it's uh, it's actually really fascinating. I think it's a sort of comprehensive look at a lot of Wolf's writing. Taking Hamlet's Mill is kind of a, a guiding principle. Yeah. So maybe you could say, like, where did it come from? I mean, obviously, we talked about how mm-hmm. Hamlet's Mill shows up in Long Sun, but what made it all kind of click is something that you really thought was more than just, oh, that's a fun reference that he might have, you know, thought about a little bit. But Well, as I was saying to Crowley, once I'd read it, it kind of captured my view of mythology and the night sky. Once you kind of incorporate it in your being, everything, you just start seeing it over and over. I mentioned the story of Kronos and um, Hermes, but it goes on. Like I mentioned the the story of the Tuatha de Danann and the, and the Fomorians, the Irish uh, mythology, origin of, of Ireland. And in that, you have the story of Lug of the Long Arm. If you imagine Orion's arm, all right, you can see, okay, okay, there's, there's Mr. Long Arm right there. And in this, there's, they fight this battle with this big Fomorian who has this eye. Whenever he look, whatever he looks at kills. And he throws the stone and kills the Fomorian and his head. Slumps. Well, it's the same. It's just like with, as I was explaining with with Argos, you kill the monster. His head slumps. He shifts. The sky shifts east, so that the stars that would normally rise at a particular time fail to rise. And when this happens, the old gods have to uh, be dispensed with. They're gone. You need new gods. You need to establish new gods. And this pattern is repeated over and over with such as uh, Ragnarok. In Ragnarok, a lot of people don't realize that the world doesn't actually end. The world is re-begun with the two children of Odin. And that's the pattern then, that that sort of falling away of old gods and new gods. That's, I guess, the real crux of one thing that you talk about is how often that comes up in wolf stories about, you know, this sort of change of pantheon. I mean, you can mm-hmm. think about Abel moving between different levels or different layers. There's the new sun, of course. Go back to Fifth Head of Cerberus. Yeah. You have uh, number five. You have the the clones who... Over and over, one succeeds the other. They are essentially the same, but they change 
names but potentially they change or, or retain names but are different and yet they are the same the the circumpolar stars if the circumpolar stars remember are these stars that in the that around the north uh pole um, the celestial north pole that never set below the horizon so if you imagine looking at this at these stars through a time lapse camera you would see a circle actually all through the night uh form and so in 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 the fifth out of cerberus um sandwalker is trapped within the hourglass within the eye so it, it continues on and on oh, number five he kills matro with a knife and this is the sword of of orion yeah so i, I it really started with picking up on hamlet's mill and then having it just kind of capture and then thinking to myself oh wait wait well the book of the new sun and the book of the long sun and the book of the short sun, all of these follow the same kind of types that you're, I'm used to seeing in myths when applied on, through the filter of Hamlet's mill. Do you think Wolf was doing that consciously, like from the beginning, or do you think that he was just kind of keyed into thinking in terms of myth and this just happens to be one way that myth is maybe deeply structured? That is a good question because Wolf obviously does uh, work with myth and on top of myth. And so one could argue, well, you know, Wolf is working on these same myths. These same kind of rules can be can apply to myth. So is it possible that what I'm just seeing is a reflection of a reflection? And I don't really think so. There are a lot of scenes that are... Well, let me give an example. In Earth of the New Sun, stop and think of the citadel as a circumpolar region. And in the in Earth of the New Sun, Severian escapes from the tower. He's in the he's in the past in in uh, at, in the citadel. He escapes from the tower. He's running, and they shoot him with this massive laser gun, which cannot kill them because, you know, he's using the power of the sun, but it cracks the broken court. And suddenly the, the witch's tower is now bent and shift. And, oh, wow, you've got all the pieces are right there. You've got the circumpolar region. You've got the tower, which is the elliptic, the, the ecliptic, I'm sorry, and which is the path of the sun across the sky. And at that same location is the Milky Way. And the Milky Way, when there is a th this shift, in in a mythological sense, actually, it, it, there's no moment where it shifts. But in the in the way these th this story is told, it does. Well, the witch's tower shifts just like that. This happens over and over and over. The I don't think that these patterns could possibly be inadvertent because he uses them exactly the same way over and over again. You see the same scenes show up in the sky over and over again within his stories where they're, oh, okay, I can rec I recognize this place in the sky. I've seen it before. Um, it even goes back, uh, even in peace, even in peace he does it, where uh, Weir runs up the stairs and kills Bobby Black. And I, oh, wow, well, okay, the Black, the, the new sun, Black sun, these are all motifs from the Popova of, uh, of, of Mayan mythology. And since Wolf does eventually quote from Hamlet's Mill, right? I mean, it does seem mm. like that would also be just <laughs> good ammunition <laughs> to say that, yeah, he, he liked that idea. The only thing I was wondering is the, the quote that he has. Um, shoot, what is the actual quote that's in Long Sun? I have it right here. <laughs> uh, I assumed you would. It's a simple way would be to admit that myth is neither irresponsible fantasy nor the object of weighty psychology, nor any other such thing. It is wholly other and requires to be looked at with open eyes. So with that, I mean, that's a that's a bit of an enigmatic quote to take from the book because it's, it's not specifically saying anything about the sky, mm -hmm. but it definitely seems a bit like a clue. <laughs> well, the something that you can look right. For. It it couldn't be from anything else, and it's there's nothing 
literary about it. There's nothing that would appeal to somebody as a, you know, the way, way a, a quote from the Aeneid or a quote from the Iliad might. Yeah, but it does definitely open up. I mean, once you found that connection, it did open up all kinds of things. Because the one thing I like about it is that so many people find like myth resonances in whatever Wolf is writing and, and sort of him just redoing myth and whatnot. And that's fine, but it doesn't by itself, just saying that he likes to retell mythic stories doesn't really give me much to go on or to say why. But when you when you actually can connect it to basically a theory of myth and what mm. myth is actually about and doing, then it becomes really interesting. And especially, I mean, for me, and I don't think this is something that you necessarily talked about directly or you, well you talk about this but you don't it's it's not really your focus but for me what's cool is that whole idea of shifting of, of the sky shifting and the gods changing that that explains so much about that one odd enigmatic thing with wolf where he says that no i think that the old gods were real that the mm -hmm. pagan gods were real but i'm also a you know Orthodox Catholic. And you're like, well, how can you have those two things be true? And it does make a neat way to say, you know, you can take both these things seriously and think about them as, you know, changes of epochs or changes of how people understand the whole context of their lives and what happens when you change those, those different contexts. And so many times, to me, at least the way Wolf seems to be dealing with religious issues is less about just kind of, I'm just going to work out a theology here mm -hmm. and more about that whole idea of sort of changing entire perspectives about, about something. And to me, that's really cool. Cause that's what Hamlet's mill is about is these strange moments where all of our sort of mythic architecture have to get reorganized and redone and changed. And that's, cool. I mean, that's a really interesting way to look at somebody's sort of deep cosmology or, or commitments, because it's really then about um, not just, you know, how do I get the stars into a story and how do I tell a story about the night sky and myths and, and make all that together. But it also does talk about, you know, things that are important in history and things that are important about how we understand how we make religious commitments or how we, what happens when we have, you know, revelations or things like that and how that changes the whole world. And so many of the world's stories seems to be about that. For me. Well, I think that this offers a little bit of insight into how Wolf, a mythophile, as was C.S. Lewis, as was Chesterton, how he approached the meaning of myth as a Christian, because the Book of the New Sun is so much embedded in the idea of symbols and why symbols are not mere contrivances. Mm -hmm. They represent something real. They're a, a phys an embodiment of something real behind it. It, 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 go, it takes us back to the idea of the woman who saw the floating Pellerine's tent mm -hmm. as it burned. And she says, no, no, that's the, you don't understand the hand of the end create. He made the world in such a way that the tent would rise rather than that the tent rose because of the way the world was. And that's the same way I think that Wolf thought of mythology and, and thought of the, the stars and the, and the myths that were drawn from the stars. I remember a comment by C.S. Lewis about the poem by Virgil, which was actually about the changing of the equinox at that time into the age of Pisces, which when you think about it, that's a, that's a very Christian idea concept. That's perfectly appropriate. Why, yeah. why, why is Jesus so associated with fish? Because Peter and John were fishermen? It's a little bit of a stretch. On the other hand, if first century Christians, second century Christians recognized that Christ's coming was a time of a particular a particular moment and that even the heavens were declaring the the glory of god then it would explain why jesus is associated with fish i mean yeah just the idea that he takes on the sign of the fish because he's part of he's the coming of the new age and it it right. makes the the heavenly you know just the stars and the astronomical thing matches with what's going on maybe in a more meaningful 
way at the same time. You take that symbol of, of the new age and make that your, your symbol. Right. And even second century uh, apolo- Christian apologists uh, were well aware of the similarity between uh, the stories of Christ and those of older mythology, of the older religions of the Greco-Roman world. And that didn't bother them at all. Some said, well, you know, the devil knew what was happening and he went around and planted lies. Or, But I think it, from Wolf's perspective, he would say that, no, we always knew that. In fact, I, I think C.S. Lewis probably said something just like this, that humanity has a, is something very similar to uh, Talos's story of, of Frankenstein influencing, uh, being influenced by these events far, so far in the future, that this event in history worked its way back into time and to understanding. And so just as there were prophets for among the Jews uh, and uh, the Israelites a thousand years earlier, there were also these prophecies among other nations as well. Okay, so you call your book, and yeah, it is a book. I know you you haven't you sometimes don't call it a book. <laughs> I don't know what I've been talking to you. What you like don't want to call it a book, but it's it's a book. Well, there's um, thirty thousand words, so it's probably right. a book right now. <laughs> but um, you call it the ogre's fingertip, mm-hmm. and that's I mean Hamlet's Mill. They took just one of many myths that they that they could have talked about in moments. And in fact, Hamlet's Mill isn't even a myth. It's, you know, Shakespeare. It's not way back mm-hmm. in ancient times and do that. But um, that's their sort of one they choose for the title. We don't have to go into the whole thing. And we're going to get, of course, to the stories that, that it comes from. But why can you briefly say why the ogre's fingertip? Why that is the, the image that stands out to you as well, a sort of good shorthand yeah. for this? Well, one of the first parts of the book of the new sun that I broke down after I began to see this pattern was the tale of the student and his son, which, okay. Yes, I know. It's kind of the story of Theseus. Yes. It's got some elements of history of the battle of the monitor, but it's also deeply embedded in cosmological language. Navis Kaput. Navis Kaput is a constellation. It's part of this great, big, giant Navis constellation, and which is a great big, it's in the form of a ship. And so that, it's a major signifier of what is going on. Once I saw that, okay, let me st- start breaking this story down. Oh, okay. Here we have the wizards in, in multicolored robes uh, producing gold. Um, they're alchemists. They produce gold just as stars produce gold within their cores. And the object is not to die, not to go down below into the underworld, below the horizon, into the sea. And we have the hero, the sun, who carries, once again, a curved sword. He sails down the path of the elliptic, and there's a whole series of constellations that he encounters along the way. He has to face the Navis Kaput, which is a strange name to begin with. And in the end, he defeats him. And he takes his fingertip as a map. And that, of course, is, it's a night sky. It's this whirling night sky Mm -hmm. above us. So we are going to talk more about that when we get to that story. I think that's, that may be good to sort of explain some other stuff. Is there something else you want to add? I mean, I know you would want, but, but just, I figured, <laughs> well, no, what I wanted to kind of do is at least just sort of clarify again, because we talked about stuff in the, like with Crowley, we just kept kind of going back and forth a lot. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be sure we had something that was very clear about like, okay, how does this apply to Wolf and mm-hmm. us and what we're going to be talking about? So. No, no, I'm, I'm obsessed with viewing myth through the lens of, of Hamlet's mill and in part, that's part of the fun of uh, of reading Wolf a, as well. Um, oh, look, I recognize this location. I'm not saying that every moment in the Book of the New Sun is mapped across the night sky. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and there have been plenty of times when we've sort of thrown little 
things out here and there mm-hmm. with, with but we haven't really drawn attention in a lot of detail to how important yeah. that was to you is what's going on behind. But especially once we get into Claw, I think yeah. that's going to get even more prominent. So we thought that Crowley was a good way to get that idea out there too. Well, why is there, why is there constant green and blue? There's not just one reason I know, but in part it's the green of the earth versus the blue of the sky, which is a sea. It, as Hamlet's Mill would describe it, the, the sea that surrounds the earth connects to the sky so that the sea, it's the sea, uh, the sky above us is actually a sea, which is comes up in the death of Dr. Island, by the way, he looks up in the sky and he sees the sea above him. And I have to say it was actually the green and the blue symbolism and how it connects to everything that actually was where this clicked for me when I was reading your stuff. Oh, yeah. Cause I was, I was, I mean, I, it was definitely interesting. And I was like, yeah, I see a lot of the stuff here, but it wasn't until, I mean, I've always known green and blue are always such powerful colors for Wolf in all kinds of mm-hmm. his stories from, I mean, small to, to everything to short son, but I never had a good explanation for why. But then when, when that part of what you had written kind of clicked for me, I was like, Oh, maybe that is. It shows up in places that you don't even expect. Like, a short story that I always talk about because it's one of my favorite by Wolf, the Counting Cats in Zanzibar, where the heck they're on a ship, they're surrounded by ocean water, and the protagonist holds up a green orange, which is our world, which says, oh, all of these events, they're myth. They happen in the sky, which is where the, according to Hamlet's Mill, the gods live. The, the stars are the gods and they and they live on the surface of the sky that whirls above us, which, by the way, is the story of the long sun, where you have the spaceship whirl, where you look above at nighttime and you see the people living above you. But yeah, so we're going to talk more about this and we wanted to explain just a little bit more about why we asked John Crowley to, to totally nerd out on that rather than his own writing. And As if just- we would need good reason to ask John Crowley to come and nerd out with us. Exactly. But it was so nice to have him, you know, be into one of these things that, that isn't necessarily the Mm -hmm. mainstream idea, but yeah, to that he could really latch on to. Well, good. Well, (laughs) there we go. There is more. If you're, if you're listening to this and mainly because you wanted to hear Crowley, then you just got a whole education and something you might not have known even was out there but I hope you found that interesting. And for those who are following along, we just wanted to give some background and context too to this because we're going to talk about this idea a lot more in coming chapters and later parts of New Sun. Yeah, we talked about it and cut a lot out. We were always cutting stuff out that, oh, okay, I mean, James is, is going off again on Hamlet's Mill and on, oh, look, the for the first chapter we uh, we did that. And I think I had a little extra file for a little while where I was like, I'll just put all this stuff over here. And then I realized that uh, (laughs) it would be so without context by the time we tried to link everything back together. (sighs) But next time we'll be back to regular chapters. Although John Crowley is not our last author interview. We've got more coming. And if you have any suggestions for people who you think would be fun to listen to either talk about Wolf or their relationship to Wolf or who have ideas or things that you feel like are directly pertinent and related to Wolf, we'd like to know because that's kind of our goal now with these um, bonus episodes is to get other people in conversation. Yeah. I really hope you do have some comments and thoughts and you know, it's okay to have complaints (laughs) about, about Hamlet's mill, but you're just going to get on my bad side, but do Bring them to us on the Facebook group or the subreddit or Twitter or email. And you can, as always, find out how to do that on the show notes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your wolf reading friends. And until you hear from us next, may the Moira favor you. See you soon. Before Lord God made the sea and the land, he held all the stars in the palm of his hand. And they ran through his fingers like grains of sand And one little star fell alone And we're lost out here in the stars Little stars, 
big stars blowing through the night and we're lost out here in the storm I'm sorry about thrilled. this uh, noise it keeps coming on oh what do you hear? I don't really hear anything. So you don't hear it? Okay, then fine. No. 